What is REST API? Well, to answer that question, let's split it into two parts. First, API stands for Application Programming Interface, and this is the way applications communicate with each other. For example, application A provides the definition of functionalities it can perform, as well as the format of requests it accepts and responses it sends. And application B uses those definitions to properly communicate with A. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. And it's not really a technology, but rather a philosophy. It's about sending a message. An architectural style which aims to provide standards for designing network applications and how they communicate. It became so popular since its introduction in early 2000s that nowadays absolute majority of API are RESTful, meaning that they adhere to the architectural constraints established by REST. There are only six of them, so let's take a look at each constraint. First one, client-server separation, means that the client and server should function as independent entities. This can allow each to evolve and improve independently without causing any issues for the other. For example, as a client, I don't need to worry about how the server stores the data. I don't care. If the server decides to switch databases, it shouldn't require any action on my part. My only responsibility is to handle the response provided by the server and that's it. Second constraint, layered system, is kind of a similar. The idea here is that if the server has a complex structure, it should be divided into multiple layers, each responsible for different tasks, such as load balancing, security, etc. And again, the client should not be concerned with what happens under the hood, what kind of layers I use, how they connect it, and so on. We don't care. The next one, uniform interface, is really important. It consists of a few key sub-rules, so to speak. But in essence, the main idea is that there should be a consistent way to interact with the server regardless of the device or application used. In addition to that, this constraint answers two very important questions. How do we identify the operation the client wishes to perform? And how do we identify which data the operation should be performed on? Let's consider an example where we have a web application for selling products to clients. Logically, we have two entities, products and clients. So instead of creating an endpoint for each possible operation on each entity, let's identify those entities as resources and assign a unique URL for each of them, and then use HTTP methods to specify the operation we wish to perform. There are four most common HTTP methods that is used for that purpose. GET to retrieve data, POST to create new entries, PUT to update existing entries, and DELETE, well, to delete an existing entry. The cacheable constraint is really easy. It states that every response should explicitly define whether it's cacheable or not. If it is, such response can be stored and reused by client instead of making same requests over and over again just to get the same data. This helps improve performance and reduce unnecessary network traffic. The next one, stateless, can be a little bit misleading due to its name. It says that each request from the client to the server must be independent and self-contained, meaning that the server should not store any information about previous requests. This raises the obvious question. If we follow this constraint, how the hell do we implement authorization? If in order to get a response, user must be logged in, we need to check it somehow, aka check his state. What is really meant by stateless is that not the state itself cannot exist, but it is simply not the job of the server to maintain and verify it. Instead, it is the responsibility of a client to make sure that every request includes all the needed data to access the resource. A good example here would be a hotel. If you stay in one, first you check in, and after that you receive the keys to your room. Now you can enter it whenever you want. You don't need to check in again every time you return to your room. The opposite of that would be the situation where instead of giving the keys to you, reception would keep it to themselves. And every time you wanted to enter your room, you had to go to reception first. They would have to verify in their logs if you checked in before and not check out yet, meaning that you are still their guest, and only after that confirmed you would be allowed to enter your room. You still get inside, but there is a lot of time wasted needlessly. That's why it is the guest who is responsible for carrying the keys. The same happens with the servers. Instead of them storing and verifying user state every time, after successful login process, they give the client an access token, which is then can be used for every subsequent request to confirm that access can indeed be granted. The last constraint, code on demand, is optional. It means that servers, if needed, can provide executable code to the client to extend some functionality. With web pages, it happens all the time. They send you a lot of JavaScript code which is executed in your browser. But if you are using some API which responds only in JSON, for example, then there is no code returned whatsoever. Okay, so hopefully all of that help you to understand what RESTful API means. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, a comment and subscribe for more. Bye.